sunny and dry. Right. Um, on to agile coaching. So I want to I want to start just by asking you what you think agile coaching is, um, and uh, and maybe just introducing myself. So I'm going to ask you about um, about what you think agile coaching is first. I'll, uh, and then I'll talk to you about some of the stuff we did at BBDTS and, and DWP. So I'll talk about what we've done, some real world, real world stuff. Um, finish off with a bit of like, where do you, where can you go to learn about this sort of stuff? What's the things that have brought me to here? So yes, I'm Steve Matsy. I'm currently a, a lead agile delivery manager, whatever that means in DWP, and I'm on a coaching placement. There's a small team of coaches within DWP. And, and that's where I am at the minute. And I've done various different bits of agile coaching in in other roles. But what I want to know is, what do you think agile coaching is? So let's just get a few people shouting out first. What 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 do you think? Feel free to put it in the chat. I can see the chat. Um, but um, feel free to shout out as well. What do you think it is? Let's have a discussion first. Being an expert or helping teams on their journey towards agility. So you should have a good grounding in agile techniques, yeah. not just one or two, but a good toolbox there. And you're not there to teach. That's what my head says. You're there to coach things there. So you, you take them along that journey at their speed. But if they're new to it, then you may have to do more. Dad, not that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do, Pete. Uh, a toolbox, I think that's a really good um, analogy for us there. An agile coach should have a number of tools in their toolbox to help the team, help the programme, help the department. Who, who else wants to throw up an opinion? Um, just a little bit uh, to touch on that. So as an agile coach, I expect you will be helping not just um, immediate team if you have one, but extend the coaching to organization wide or department wide coaching. So right coaching from the top to the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think you're right there. So a scrum master or a delivery manager tends to focus on one team. So particularly maybe like a um a, a, a standard level or a senior, you probably one or maybe a couple of teams and then maybe a lead works across three or four teams, but an agile delivery manager has a different, uh, uh, an agile coach has a different focus, and I think that focus to go beyond boundaries is absolutely is absolutely right, and um, and challenge and create change. So yeah, I don't think uh, I would expect an agile coach to be in one team necessarily. I would expect an agile coach. So for example, at the minute I'm in health. And I'm working on the the health assessment. So I'm working with three teams within a kind of a seven team area, uh, quite quite um, quite intensively. But then also the the kind of the delivery triangle, as they call it, above that, the the, the team above the team that should help with coordination. So I'm trying to hit, hit different levels and, and and work at both a strategy, a coordination, and then an, an operational layer with those teams. Thanks, Teo. Anybody else want to want to offer up a, a thought on what agile coaching is? I would say it's along the lines of like having a safe space to really show the team what they're doing, because I think a lot of it comes from having that awareness in the first place. So I don't think you need to tell. I think you just need to show where people are, and guide them to putting the pieces together themselves, because I think that's how the really learn is from working it out themselves and you just guide them in the right way rather than um, being a more kind of command and control side of things. Yeah, yeah, that word coaching, um, holding the mirror up and asking questions and, and playing games, I'm going to talk about um, a bit later. So yes, adopting that coaching perspective. Now, I think early in my career, I maybe adopted that coaching perspective a little bit too strongly and um and and uh, particularly at my, my kind of my first time when i was an agile coach i would say I, I asked lots of questions and i kept asking and i kept asking and actually there was a bit of frustration there and they, they just wanted some answers so i think yes the majority of the time we probably want to be offering that coaching stance first 
I think let's be aware of uh, you can't coach knowledge you can't coach the awareness of um, of scrum of a, of a scaling framework or of, uh, of lean tools and techniques sometimes you've just got to tell people so I think I think you're right absolutely George in that the, the vast majority of the time we want to be adopting that coaching stance first and so one of my kind of one of my favorite things I'll, I'll tell people about coaching is if somebody asks me for a piece of advice or what would you do here Steve and I'll say well, you give me two options, and then I'll tell you what I think. And quite often, they'll um, they'll sort of they'll go through the two options. Go, actually, yeah, that one's pretty good, isn't it? And I'll I'll say mine, and then they'll go off with theirs. So they had the answer there themselves already. It's interesting. It's interesting. Sorry to interrupt. It's interesting then to to look at your definition of coaching then, alongside what you'd see as a mentor, compared to an agile mentor and agile coach. So yeah. you're two fulfilled a completely different roles and I know some of the, the comments that have come out are probably splitting both um, but I know as, for me as a coach it'll be somebody who will work alongside the team that will will guide them to what they need to do and give them their experiences rather than sort yeah. of a mentor being able to sort of say to them I'm going to walk alongside you let you choose your own things so yeah I, I see them as a, a sort of a bit of a, a, a both split between both in a way yeah, I think I think agile coaching is a bit of, and, and the next slide, the next thing I'll show you is a bit of, bit of an umbrella to a, a lot of these terms. So I think as an agile coach, I will mentor, I will coach, I will teach, I will train, um, and I, I will consciously take those um, those hats and wear those hats at, at different points. So for me, a um, a coach has good questions for your answers and a mentor has good answers for your questions. So a, a, a kind of a, a professional mentor, I would expect them to be providing lots of advice and that to be, and, and for it to be someone who's further ahead. But for a coach, a, 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 for a kind of a professional coach, I, I wouldn't, I, you don't have to be further ahead. You don't have to have managed in that particular field um, and, and being, being much senior. I think you can you can coach because you're asking questions. I think you can you can coach where you, you couldn't uh, mentor. So let's have maybe one more. Then what what do you think? Um, what's your opinion on what is agile coaching? Feel free to be as controversial as you like. I'd like controversial. Just just a quick thing. I'm happy to chuck in here is. Um... I believe something that's worth highlighting is that agile coaching, and I'm happy to be challenged this, it's not just purely coaching. It's not just taking a single stance of saying, being reflective. And I like the way you said it, Stephen, about you know, helping teams be um, holding the mirror up to them. But like you've already mentioned, multiple stances. I think there's sometimes the danger of people saying, oh, professional coaching and agile coaching, aren't they the same? I believe there are distinct differences. Absolutely, Louis, absolutely. I know you like your coaching and I agree with you completely. So here we see our um, uh, diagram. So I'm trying to lean out the way of it here. Um, so this is a, a, a bit of an, an X-wing diagram, I think it's called, and it's from a book called Agile Coaching by Lisa Adkins, which I would, I would highly recommend. Really, really good book. And she talks about these as being a number of competencies that, are, that an Agile coach should have. So obviously, right up at the top, we need to be um, aware of agile and lean practices, values, mindset. They're at the heart, aren't they, of an agile coach. Those mind, the mindset, the principles operating with visibility, transparency. Um, so really um, living those values yourself, honesty, um, visibility. Um, professional coaching, we've talked about in the top right. Um, so... I would, yeah, I would highly recommend um, if you haven't been on a coaching course, trying to find one of those. The um, the skills you will gain from that will be um, will be incredible. The ability to listen, the ability to reflect, hold the mirror up to a team, the ability to ask an insightful, a powerful question, and that 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 is your perspective there. Um, facilitation, so being able to. Um, being able to hold a room to to, to walk a room through a, um, 
a process and help them help them come to decisions, help them discuss really um, really hard things to discuss, help the help um, help with high conflict situations and mediate. So facilitations, um, yeah, really really key skill, and it's hard to get right, isn't it? Um, to to maintain yourself and be very neutral in that situation, and um, but to to at the same time guide people through that process, monitor um, simple things like we're at half past now, we've got an hour left. Like, is this the most valuable thing for us to be spending our time on? To I mean, I've been in some really interesting situations with teams trying to just tear themselves apart, incredibly aggressive kind of individuals and you've got to stand there and maintain that that neutral posture and and, and ask a, a, a question to the group that um that enables them to, to come to come together but also when um when do you need to kind of take some of those behaviors uh, and is my screen share still working yeah um, yeah when do you need to take some of those behaviors offline? So transformation, business mastery and technical mastery as well. So we're in software, so we should understand how software is being built. Um, we should understand, I think, basic content, concepts like continuous integration, like testing, um, like, like development. We should be able to speak um, th that language as an agile coach. We should understand the business. We're in the business of public services. We should know what a good service looks like. Transformation, how do we create change? Maybe some of those lean tools there. Mentoring, somebody talked about that, yeah. Being able to say, well, look, I, I've um, managed deliveries like this in the past and I've tried this and suggesting things, absolutely part of it. Um, and I do, uh, I, I do a lot of that with, with people. Um, sit down and they ask me advice and, and they find that very valuable. I think I prefer to be in the coaching space, and I tend to tend to end up there, asking more questions than answers, um, asking more questions and providing answers, and then teaching as well. So yeah, teaching really, um, really, really important. I think and something that we learned a lot about. I think over the over the course of this. So about two and a half years ago, I joined an organisation called BPDTS, which was part of DWP. Um, before you asked, BPDTS didn't actually mean anything. Um, there was no names behind. Yes, I know, I know, it's very strange. But we were a, a small subsidiary of, of DWP providing um, people into DWP Digital. And one of the things uh, our then um, CEO, Love Day, Ryder, wanted to do was, was to be more agile. So she brought in these um, these folk called um, these folk, these consultants up here and this is what this green line is showing is the amount of consultants we had and, and they did lots of lots of training and went around and delivered various qualities of training and created a bit of momentum and then we discovered well actually we're not getting much much change here what's happening and so what they did was that they hired a lot of people and I came on board about around this sort of time and we, we started to uh, and there was we started to sort of throw a few people at this so we started to pair up with um, with these consultants and try and understand what they would what they were actually doing here what were we paying these agile coaches for which looked like well, just going and do and doing a couple of coach, um, a couple of training sessions with people, um, and that, and that wasn't having massive impact. It was definitely positive in terms of um, training, in terms of getting that knowledge into people's heads. But um, but yeah, very push, very um, just awareness of things, and, and little kind of follow up and relationship build, and ultimately capability build. So, um, so we came on board and, and we slowly started to kind of ramp those consultants down and build um, build more um, BPDTS people. And um, so what you can see is I've, I've used Emily Weber's um, communities of practice model there to talk about, well, consultants were there to well, gain momentum. Then we came in, matured the service, and I'll talk about what we did to do that in, in a minute. And then we're now probably getting to the point where it's self-sustaining. And now we've gone into DWP, we're doing a lot more um, kind of to, to build that coaching service beyond a few 
core people to, to build out a catalogue of people across DWP who can go and help other areas. So that's our focus. We're probably somewhere in, in this sort of space at the minute, really. And, and so what did we do? We tried to switch to a, a pull. We tried, we sent lots of communications. We tried to talk about what the benefits of this agile coaching was. We had champions within teams. So we asked people who, who wanted to, to lead it within teams and we'd, we'd really support them as well with like one-to-one -one mentoring, one-to-one -one coaching alongside the stuff we do with teams. We'd go to communities and, and do lots of stuff there again to, to talk about the value this this could be um, we talked with leadership as well so um one of the kind of the key areas i worked in was service management and we did a lot of work with leadership um and in getting them to to live the value so we would escalate things to them but also asking them to operate with an agile mindset to be transparent to be open and uh, built relationships as well so one of the first things we did was to say, well, um, all these teams you've been working with, like, where are they? You've got these rough acceptance criteria that they'd written into a contract. And um, what we found was teams were just like everywhere. And, uh, and we put, um, we, uh, we, we came across this kind of thing. This is Ken Blanchard's situational leadership model. And we used this to, to operate with an agile mindset here to create visibility so um we um, so we had a column here which was not started so directing was that intense period we're going to go and spend three six weeks with this team so that uh, directing is we're being quite directive here we're um, we're doing lots of training we're doing lots of uh, maybe interventions coaching that was starting to ramp down maybe these are people that need a little bit more support we've got champions in those teams um, and, and, and we're supporting them and then supporting is, is again a step further down so we're spending very little time maybe we catch up with them once a month and then delegating that's um, kind of like well these might be a, a bunch of teams that actually we want to spread um, their knowledge and what they've done so we came up with this um, yeah, situational leadership model and applied it and, and got our consultants to put where they thought teams were. And then we, we used this to manage how we, um, how we interacted with, um, with, with different teams. And that, that was really useful. We also limited work in progress. So we said, well, actually, how many teams can we have in directing? And I think, I think from memory, we picked two in directing was our max. And so when we had, I think, three, four people, we, uh, the max we would want in directing was eight. So we, we, um, we had a whip limit in there. Yes, it was Jira, yes. Um, thanks, Emma, for answering these questions. Um, yes, so what did we do? So that was our first step, to, to create um, a visualisation, create a dashboard, show the work, show the teams, and then we would use that in a show and tell with our with our leadership we go and talk about the teams where we thought they were um, and that that became a really useful dashboard for us bpdts originally stood for yes it did um it was just the acronym in the end yeah andy what challenges did we have um psychological safety yeah so it, there, there was a, a lack of a lack of trust why are you here i don't want to put my work on a kanban board like i don't want to do that like and put that uh, it put that up there in the office so uh, there was a, a real trust to build with these um with these teams um servant leadership so the the idea that um well that's that's servant leadership that's all right that's just that's just normal leadership isn't it now the, te the teams scrum masters delivery managers they do that don't they but actually um the kind of the, the the other layers of the hierarchy there um no you need to live this you need to um put these um, things that we're trying to change you need to put them on a board you need to talk about them regularly you need to make that board visible we want to put that up in um in the middle of the office what are the things that you're doing as a, a as a, a leadership group to support this needed to create that momentum 
fixed mindsets yes yeah yeah I, and um uh, yeah this is this is a, a, a tough one for me yeah um yeah it, it works yeah we've do, we've got that already i'm just trying to get you to put a few post-it notes tell everybody in the team what work you're doing oh no we've got that we've got that already we'll do it in excel okay right show me the excel spreadsheet then um turned out one person on the team had an excel spreadsheet and they could only access it and it just absolutely wasn't visible so um and and, and just no we find it works it, we've we've done it this way for 30 years i think was was one of the teams 30 years we've done it this way yeah it's fine um so absolutely and the answer to that is absolutely i'm sure it does work and you have been doing a fabulous thing delivering this benefit it, it, it's it's superb it does work all i'm saying is look there might be some better ways to do it let's just have a go at taking on some improvements can we just have a go at improving it is working and i acknowledge that silos within teams and handoffs yes um just loads of teams within teams and you've, you've kind of got to drive that out one of my favorite things is is the um the ballpoint game the devops ballpoint game and what you do in that is you is you throw balls at people so you can demonstrate a number of things with that constraints pull systems push systems but my favorite thing is uh is incentive so they're, they're passing balls to each other and they're trying to get them in these cups and then that represents product and and, and uh, at some point you pull a whiteboard in the middle and you go right and um, we've decided that the team needs to be split between operations and development because of these new regulations um, and then they have to throw them over the wall and the behaviors that creates is uh, and lots of dropped balls <clears throat> and then you introduce incentive so i take a big tray of donuts in and i go right um so you on the operations side we can't have any defects here no defects no no balls on the floor and on the other side i say development group we need to get this done you need to get all these balls across here you need to get them over that whiteboard we need to get this new product out so they've got very different competing incentives and i i, I offer them each a um a tray of donuts if they do it and then of course the development group just throw the balls over and the operations group invent some very strange systems of like capturing them in their jumpers and all sorts of stuff to stop them dropping and it's absolute carnage isn't it so um, lots and lots of silos, and, uh, and we need to try and try and drive those out. It won't work here. No, it won't work here. Hands up if you've uh, if you've ever heard that. Has anybody ever? Yep, it doesn't work here. And the answer to that is, well, no, it will. It works at, like pretty much everywhere, really, doesn't it? Um, it works for HR teams. There's definitely bits of this that can add value. Let's let's just have an open mind. Let's have a look at it. And let's see which of the bits and start small and just just do, make some small changes and, and, and build on them so lots of challenges as um as i'm sure everybody gets agile's not the goal agile's a means to an end so i think this is one thing i like to be is, is very pragmatic and very practical so not talking theory agile with a big a we stopped talking about agile. We didn't use the word agile. Like, I'm doing agile coaching, and I'm not using the word agile. Because people, I think, have got this agile debt that they've had agile transformations done to them time and time again. They're like, oh, it's just another project management methodology. So don't talk about it. And we ended up talking about, um, about three things. We ended up going to teams and talking about um, what we're going to get you doing is um, operating with visibility and transparency. So we're going to get you communicating and collaborating. We're going to get you the tooling you need. And then we just want to get you improving. So get you into a cycle of improvement. Communicating and collaborating. We'll support you with, with tooling, whatever tooling you need. And we just want to get you improving. And it, it was all the agile stuff, wasn't it? It was like, right, let's do some scrum stuff with them. Um, let's, let's get them just running regular retros as a first step. Like, that's what I would do. Some of the most resistant teams would be like, let's just run a retro every two weeks and I'll just make it as fun and as brilliant as I could. Just try and engage everybody. And then and then I would um, and then I would chase those improvements through. Uh, and, and then I would show that, look, this is actually working to them. And then I'll build that trust with the team. 
So, yes, what did we focus on? Simplicity, continuous improvement, visibility and transparency in communication. Yeah, that's roughly what I said, isn't it? Um, by doing it, yeah. So, yeah. What else? What else? Yeah, we did. We, we had the champions and we spent a lot of time with those. We found that really, really useful to have people within the teams. So we thought that was very, that, that was a, a, yeah, a good way to, to get influence when you weren't there. One thing that seems to be talked about as well is me standing on the um, on the balcony. So in Benton Park View in Newcastle, there's a three there's three floors, and one team I was working with was on the second floor, and I was on the third floor. And occasionally, I would not go to their stand up. So this was probably the, one of the worst teams I've ever worked with. And um, what I wanted to do was see whether they were actually valuing these processes. So um, and um, uh, so I didn't go to the stand-up a few times and I was watching off the balcony to see if they were doing it. And every time when they stood up and did it, I was like punching the air because they actually valued um, doing it and they were doing it when I wasn't there um, telling them to do it. So that was a, gr that was a great thing. And the, the champion was a real help in doing that. Um, yeah, getting leadership to, to, to like actually live these values, putting stuff on a board in the office, attending stand-ups, acting as a servant. Yeah, real footage from Benton Park View. And we also dragged um, stuff in from uh, external. So we took teams to see other teams. We, we um, took people across to HMRC to see some of their stuff. So we tried to show people that, no, this actually does work in government here. So, oh, no, it won't work here. It's working over there. Like, I can take you down the corridor and we'll go to HMRC and I'll show you. Um, so, a lot of doing that. Um, Spotify health check. I think we use things like this as well to um, to just get, get a, a sense of where teams are and get a sense of where to improve. I think I'm, I'm not going to really dwell on that too much. But if you Google the Spotify health check, really good, simple way of assessing where a team is across a number of, of different uh, processes. Re it works really well as a good workshop. Run it every every quarter, maybe, and you can, you can kind of really easily track where, where a team is. Um, you can, and you, yeah, there's, there's loads of value to that. Um, get the team to do it, self-assess. You can identify themes coming out a number of different teams. So you can see the squads up at the top of different squads there. Who's getting better, who's getting worse. Squad two is probably the one you're going to go and look at, isn't it? Um, mind you, they're getting better, aren't they? Um, so, yeah, squad two is probably the one you're going to go and spend a bit of time. Thanks, Sean. That's brilliant. We, we went a bit further than that. We have developed our own kind of capability model. I'm not a massive fan of maturity matrices. I think they can be restrictive, if I'm honest with you, and it can lead you to recipe-based cookie-cutter agile. But what we've done here um, is to create something that's massively outcome-based. So we're, we're trying desperately to stay away from, you do retros, you do this. We, we're talking about the outcomes that we want to see from teams. So what do we want here as an outcome? We want a culture of continuous improvement. We want collective ownership of goals, for example. And, and we're not trying to get people to sort of follow a process here. We, we're talking about the outcomes that we want. So this is a, so we've got a number of, uh, something we developed ourselves. Um, we've got a number of uh, different dimensions, culture and values, architecture and technical agility, lean, agile team delivery. And so we spent a, a lot of time developing this ourselves so we could have that evidence-based conversation with teams. So it, it, any of these sorts of things are about knowing yourself. So uh, know our capability and then being able to, to take an action plan off, off the back of that. But also, for me, escalating a bunch of stuff. So in health at the minute, I'm doing these, these sort of assessments with teams. They're self-assessing themselves. And then what I'm going to do is take some of the themes out of that and go to that, um, that delivery triangle and say, look, these are the big themes. The teams are saying they're not empowered. Um, and, 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 and I've got that evidence from kind of three teams here. What are we going to do about it? And then I'm going to propose a strategy board maybe using some of the flight level stuff. 
what else have we done? As, as an agile coach, what else have I done? Um, community, I think, is a really big thing for me um, because if you, you can't kind of push coaching on people, you've got to pull it. And I need to get to communities and get people to know who I am, get people to know the coaching service and want it. Um, you, what you can see, so this is this is the ball game here, actually. Um, and so this was our chief financial officer here, Mal Singh. Um, so this is them playing like playing that sort of stuff with leadership you can you can absolutely do this um, and that and that sort of stuff games is, is better for me because you realize um so if i go into a team and i tell them you're doing your stand-ups terribly you're being awful it just turns them off doesn't it but if i go in and play the scrum from hell with them and i give them dysfunctional cards and say you act out <coughs> and secretly and, I, and you act out this behavior you act out be specific and detailed you act out be um come in and be late and and ask about things that are already be discuss being discussed you, you act out be disruptive they realize it themselves and they go oh, damn yeah that's me isn't it so i've gone i've gone you're being heavily disruptive here and and you're um taking the the stand up over 15 minutes um but without without saying that haven't i they've realized it themselves and i think that's a much more powerful way for people to to learn themselves rather than hearing it from me we did delivery insights so we got people to share bite-sized learning and we're continuing to do this with we're building a coaching community now we have a, a clinic based what? session through so somebody going to come in there no we have a clinic based session please do interrupt we have a clinic based session we have um, teaching based sessions where we might introduce a tool or a technique and talk through it we have um, case studies, so we're trying to build that community of coaching to support our coaches. Um, and that's what that delivery drop-in was for a period of time. A number of different things I would expect an agile coach to do. So very, very practical stuff like get Jira and, um, and, and set a board up for people. Walk the team through creating that workflow, like if, um, or, or support the delivery manager in doing that. R real like and do that at program level as well why can't you have a program kanban team charters like games playing games with them we've talked a lot now i'd expect you to an agile coach to be able to have some support of uh, it, it, with the tooling for you to be able to um, make that make that work so a tool shouldn't drive a team's process the process should drive the true the tool um, support team events a lot of what I do is like um, a lot some of what I do is well here's a number of really great ideas for retros and for sessions and facilitation stuff uh, 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 I mean a number of kind of teaching elements and I think we, we saw great value in building relationships through training as well so doing scrum master training so particularly with um, with the service management people, that got us real buy-in. That built those relationships. We we did the professional scrum master. We taught them that ourselves. And we brought a, a lot of that internally. So professional agile leadership, we we now teach internally, and, um, and PSM professional scrum with Kanban. So these like even scaled agile framework. Um, so. Uh, being able to to teach and to and to talk through that theory but always with a practical mindset always with a solving the re real world problems for people so recently i did something around forecasting and estimation and i i, I don't massively like story points i think we can we can do better than that and, and we can use some of the forecasting stuff um but this team actually just needed to, to start estimating stuff and to start working in sprints. So they ended up with story points and that's fine. We're getting them improving, we're getting them moving forward. So kind of more theory based stuff. And then individual, a lot of one-to-one -one stuff, uh, mentoring, absolutely do that, coaching. So the civil service coaching scheme, I'm a civil service coach, is absolutely fabulous. It's open to anybody. Get yourselves on civil service learning. If you've never been coached, I would highly recommend it. Get yourselves on civil service learning and look for the internal coaches catalogue. And there's a catalogue of people there who are professionally trained coaches who can have coaching sessions with you. So you could you could you can go and have chemistry sessions with them. 
with a number of different people where you um, where you um, you get to kind of discuss what coaching is and think about how you might might work with them. So go and see some coaching, have some coaching yourselves. I found that massively massively valuable for me. I have a coach supervisor and she's fabulous and she continues to push and challenge me and support me as I hopefully I do for my coaches and then yeah individual bits of training as well so like so champions delivery managers in teams like let's just like let's walk through this bit of training material what do you understand what don't you understand and and, and delivering through through them yes um yeah, I mean, so me and Ashley are trying, and Hannah are trying to put together a good stakeholders course as well. So where we talked about organisational boundaries and getting beyond the team and the programme, we want to be trying to sort of change the organisation, don't we? So what what does it mean to be a stakeholder in, in an agile world in this? Um, and what do we need from them? So we're putting together something that we can we can run with stakeholders, simple principles, mindset, what we want from them. Um, so so yeah, con- like training, I think uh, yeah, absolutely um, a, a key element to it, and safe as well. I think a lot of people are looking at safe and thinking, God, it was this guy touting safe. We absolutely don't do that. Um, what we want to do is argue from a point, and Emma made this this point very well. We want to argue from a point of knowledge. So where we have consultancies coming in and saying we need to do full safe, we need to do this, this, and this, we can actually go. No, actually, I'm an SPC, safe program consultant, and it it doesn't say that. And why will you do that? What's what's that for? What's that bit of value about? And um, and so we find really useful to to train it because. It, it's very expensive and there's actually a good return on investment on our time so we can get it much much cheaper and we don't um we don't sell it we present the material and we say what do you think about it whereas if you go on the external course they're going to sell it and they're going to ram it down your throat we present the material and we let you make your mind up and we let you pick maybe a bit out of it that's really useful we're not going to try and sell it so it's it's about giving people the knowledge to make the right decisions <clears throat> so agile coaching then um, what if, if you were interested in, in being an agile coach and wanted some training as we've just been talking about training here's one so the I see agile coaching course um, is based on Lisa Atkins book agile coaching and it's he's, he's, he's pretty good it gives you a um, an awareness of of each of those uh, things that we talked about at the start. I would have a look at that. It's not too expensive. That's something we're we're doing at DWP. It seems to be roughly the best course that's out there at the minute. But you're going to need to practice. That isn't going to give you everything you need. You need to practice with teams. Here's, um, if if you like reading, if you like books, um, here's something um, I think Here's some books that I think could be really, really useful for you in in each of those sections. So Scrum Mastery from Jeff Watts, um, Applying Agile Practices, very practical book, How to Be a Scrum Master. Implementing Lean Software Development, Mary and Tom Poppendick, that's still the Bible for me on Lean, Lean Software Development, love that. The Tower of Coaching, if you think, really nice, small, digestible book. On, on coaching facilitation I think you've got to try that out but I'd highly recommend liberating structures transformation mastery I mean that's that book there is written by um, the people who who were involved early with GDS good services we are in the, uh, the the game we're in is delivering public services we should understand what good services look like that book from Lou down technical mastery I mean I've put that book there but there's loads of stuff isn't there continuous integration continuous uh, delivery. There's absolutely loads and loads of really good stuff. I might put in business mastery and transformation mastery. I might put team topologies as well. Um, mentoring, coaching agile teams. I just wanted to put that there. I haven't got anything specific on mentoring, but I think that book is is absolutely foundational to um, if you, if you've got aspirations to become an agile coach. And then teaching, so training from the back of the room. Sharon Bowman talks about how to make things really interactive and uh, how to make things stick. 
so that's a, that's a good book I probably wouldn't buy the book I think I'd probably just just have a bit Google first I've got the book but it's, it's not it's not great so that's trying to give you some some things to um, to read or to, to Google and have a have, have a look at uh, on YouTube or whatever whatever you fancy if you're interested in this what are we doing at the minute we're building a, um, a coaches catalogue internally of people who can help each other um, so this is um, a, a little catalogue that we're going to put out there and people can pull down and say um, I, I need help with this um, or I'll look on there it's that person right I'm going to send that person a message so we're trying to build a bit of a coaching scheme I want to finish off with, and sorry I haven't got m much time for questions, but being agile isn't the goal. We're here to deliver public services to citizens, aren't we? So when you're doing any agile coaching, we're not trying to make people, um, um, trying to make people agile, are we? We're, we're trying to deliver public services. Delivery is the strategy, is that kind of strap line, isn't it? That's why, we, that's why we're doing things. So please, um, yeah. Please, please do remember that. Um, five minutes. Do you want to throw some questions at me real quick? Stephen, you showed like a Kanban style board in JIRA for when you were initially looking at all the different teams that you were kind of looking at coaching and tracking where they were and stuff. I just thought all the teams mature do you then do some element of looking at the health checks, you know, the rag status, whatever you want to call it, of those teams, and then work out, actually, we need to go back and do more with this team? Do you, is that a constant thing you would look at doing? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think you want to be doing those sort of assessments maybe every three months. And ideally, you want the teams to do them and value them. And, and they yeah. want to take those, those improvements on so that it's not, a, it's not a thing. And maybe you're just looking at, a dashboard of them all that's pulled together and you're looking for trends which ones are trending right. down and um and then maybe you need to go and have a chat what's what's happening here how can we help so yes i i would i would ask the teams to do those themselves every every three months and if they're finding it's a it's a real bore and a challenge i think there's probably a problem with the assessment we need to improve that and make it more valuable Cool. Okay. I know internally for us, the, the health checks we do are driven by the compliance teams and they're not really what you're talking about and thus they, we don't get the buy-in from the teams. So it's um, mm. yeah, interesting. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Could you create them with the teams? Could you create those uh, those health checks? That Spotify health check is really good start. It's a really good start. Cool. Thanks. Steve, this Justin. Do you have any particular uh, tips or techniques for overcoming the, the on one of the early slides was something about fixed mindsets. Is there anything specific you could call out to help? Fun, making things fun and enjoyable. Um, retros that are yeah really fun and engaging and tricking people into it, tricking people into growth through making things fun. I think. Um, metrics data I think having a chat with people and seeing what motivates them as well so what's people's usually there's positive intent I try and as assume positive intent from everybody and so what are they trying what what are they trying to do with that with that fixed view trying to get beyond that and understand what it is and then try and work with that motivation but generally I try and make things fun and engaging and and then just show improvements really quickly so that they can see things are happening. Praise as well. Thank you. Hey, Stephen. I have one, um, not in my current role, but my previous role, I worked with a lot of contractors and they were very, very high skilled at their job, dead, full stack developers. And when I'm a big fan of gamifying things, if you were to try and gamify, and we had brought in an agile coach to try and you know, help with the agile, we're going through a big agile and digital transformation, and there was the last thing they would engage with. They just didn't have any time for gamifying it. They weren't, to their exact words, they, did, they didn't want to feel like a child, you know, they know what they need to do, get on with it. What, what would your approach and thoughts be in, in those types of scenarios? Because what we had, we had, they were contractors, very skilled, and you could just leave them to do anything, but we also had a, an X number of 
permanent resources that were quite new to agile ways of working and we're going to get a lot of value out of the, the gamifying of, of um, like to retros, estimations and things like that. I don't know. I think I try and engage these people, these very highly paid, highly skilled people and see how they could, um, what they could offer the kind of the, 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 the more new to Agile. I think I'd, I'd try and engage them. I think it'd be the same. I'd have a, a really good conversation with them and um, try and understand what was behind that. I think what probably they just want to get on. They just want to le- get left yeah. alone and, and get on with stuff. But that's not it, is it? That's not the game. Sometimes you've just got to disagree. Part of the work is collaborating. Mm-hmm. Like, I think consultants and, and contractors, we should use them in a more enabling sense. So they sh- we should use them to enable our teams. So they shouldn't be delivering as much as uh, as, as much as they are, I think. They, we should be using them to create capability within the organisation, to teach, mm-hmm. to train, to mentor. And I, I, I feel like I'd, I'd be talking to them about some things like that um and yeah i think situational awareness you're right like don't don't force games down people's throats if they're not going to engage with them don't turn people off and and do you feel do you feel you need to have done um kind of like a major agile transformation to become a coach or you know or do you think do you think doing the certifications is enough um you know because we know you could swallow the you could, you know, you pick up the dictionary and you could do every course, but real world experience, you know, whether whatever framework you're using, it will never be the exact. You know, everybody puts their own flavor on it because that's what works for organizations. And sometimes you need that kind of real world, practical, in the weeds, kind of views and experiences and scars in a lot of cases. But what's your, what's your thoughts on that as well? I think the training's useful. I think you're going to get a lot of knowledge from it. But yeah, absolutely, you've got to have the experience. Do I think you've got to have been through a massive transformation and led it? No. Otherwise, nobody would have um, nobody would have been an agile coach, would they? So I think just just keep putting yourselves keep putting yourself in those tricky situations. Keep advocating for change and um, and keep learning. So yeah, keep keep learning and keep putting yourself in situations where you're where you're challenged where you're a bit nervous so i think it's it's a mix of both like i try really hard to develop myself over time but also i'm making sure i'm i'm close to the work and um, and 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 things the real world problems as well thanks mate we're over time aren't we we've overrun I was going to say a huge thanks, lots of thanks popping up in the chat. Thank you to everyone for turning up. Stephen, your experience has shone through amazingly. Uh, so that's fantastic. Hope everyone's learned something.